थैंक यू गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन एंड वेलकम बैक टू अ वीकली वेबिनार सीरीज वी आर टेकिंग अप अ वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग टॉपिक टुडे दैट इज द इवैल्यूएशन मैट्रिक्स ओवर टू अनंत सर अंकित वेलकम टू 117th episode of AAA weekly webinar series the subject that we have chosen today is the evaluation matrix or we can even call bid evaluation matrix uh, we have gone through maybe more than 250 evaluation matrices in our practice so far because see as triple a insolvency uh, we have been supporting to our partners and to outsiders in approximately 320 cases of cirp and liquidation so since this evaluation matrix is only a concept of cirp therefore we are saying that we have an experience of about 250 evaluation matrix because in some cases it is the change in the evaluation matrix is also seen so our experience is about 250 evaluation matrix today we would be discussing our experience and also we would be discussing the purpose and the importance of the evaluation matrix how it started and what is the purpose and the importance today various formats have been released as a kind of guidance by one ibbi to three ipas the institute of chartered accountants ipa institute of cost and management accountants ipa and institute of company secretaries ipa all have released a format for the evaluation matrix which can be used for evaluation of resolution plans received in a corporate insolvency resolution process we have also found some of the judicial orders which actually will further give us some input on the importance of evaluation matrix now the when we see the introduction in the beginning of the insolvency process in india the focus was that it would be entirely a transparent and efficient resolution process this bid evaluation matrix was basically made as a kind of uh, format for evaluating the resolution plans received during a process by the committee of creditors this was the objective and accordingly uh, the definition of evaluation matrix was given in regulation 2 sub regulation h a in the ibbi regulations cirp regulations now it defines as evaluation matrix means such parameters to be applied and the manner of applying such parameters as approved by committee for consideration of resolution plans for its approval so that means there there are parameters so according to formats given by ibbi ipas there are two parameters one is the qualitative and the other is quantitative quantitative means where the actual amount and other things which are offered and qualitative means the quality of the resolution applicant second part of the definition say that it should be approved by the committee of creditors now it is not mentioned that who will prepare therefore we are assuming that it will be prepared collectively by the resolution professional and the committee because the committee has to see what kind of considerations the uh, particular resolution plan they are looking forward to for their approval <clears throat> it can be different for different kind of uh, companies different kind of committee of creditors if the committee of creditors is very heavy on secured financial creditors and that to banks and financial institutions they will go by their own priorities when they approve evaluation matrix or when they make evaluation matrix in consultation with the arb in case the committee of creditors is made of home buyers or or it is home buyer heavy then they will make the 
evaluation matrix according to their own preferences and according to their own considerations, like what kind of resolution plan they would prefer. Similarly, in case the committee of creditors are basically heavy towards the operational creditors or towards the statutory uh, obligations, then the committee of creditors will make the evaluation matrix according to their own preferences and according to their own choices. So it is not the RP's choice, it is the choice of committee of creditors. It is not the RP's preference, but it is the preferences of committee of creditors. So the committee of creditors will also act differently for different kind of corporate debtors, for different segment of industry, for different segment of businesses. So this is what my experience is. All the formats provided by IBBI and all the IPAs cannot fit for all. This is not something which is fit for all. So these formats are only kind of providing us the format and also kind of providing us the some understanding about the evaluation matrix. But these formats cannot be considered as fit for all. I have seen, I have seen in many cases that the most of the my professional colleagues, they are somehow uh, adopting these formats as if it is a guidelines. Generally, these are only guidelines regarding format, but as far as the preferences are concerned, preferences regarding the parameters, qualitative parameters and qualitative parameters can change. In some cases, some of the parameters, and in some cases, all the parameters as suggested by IBBI or as suggested by IPS can be changed. Now, let us see what Regulation 36 Capital B of the CIRP regulation says. It says that the RP shall, within five days of the date of issue of final list of the prospective resolution applicants, issue the information memorandum, evaluation matrix, and RFRP to every resolution applicant in the final list. In a proviso, it is also said where such documents are available, the same may also be provided to every prospective resolution applicant in the provisional list. Now, why this proviso was added? Because see, in the provisional list, if somebody is not appearing in the final list, that prospective resolution applicant has a right to go for appeal. And in case in the appeal, it is decided that his participation cannot be restricted and he would finally appear in the final list so that there is no wastage of time. So he also gets the documents regarding IM, evaluation matrix, and RFRP. All the three documents can also be should also be given to the provisional list of PRS. Now, the any modification in the RFRP and the evaluation matrix that also would be given to the prospective resolution applicants maybe provisional list or final list. However, it is restricted now that we can't have more than two iterations. So there is one original and one is the modified one. So there is no third unless it is permitted by NCLT. So therefore, the total timeline as per section, as per regulation 36 capital B of CIRP regulations, that this particular document has to be issued on T plus 105 days. 105 days at that particular time it has to be issued. Now let us understand what is the importance of this evaluation matrix which is provided in regulation 39 of the CIRP regulation. It says, it says that the committee shall, the committee of creditors shall evaluate the resolution plans received under sub-regulation 2 as per evaluation matrix. That means the committee has to evaluate all resolution plans as per the evaluation matrix. So evaluation, normally it is done by the resolution professional and it is supervised by the committee of creditors. It is presented before the committee of creditors. Committee of creditors can also add uh, their own comments and they can also uh, modify in case they feel that it is not appropriately made. B. 
record its deliberations on the feasibility and viability of each resolution plan and vote on all such resolution plans simultaneously. That means that if a resolution plan is legally compliant, it is compliant to RFRP and record its feasibility and viability of each resolution plan and then vote all such resolution plans simultaneously. That means that irrespective of the evaluation metric, irrespective of the scoring in the evaluation metric, irrespective of the H1, H2, H3, H4, all the resolution plans will be put to vote simultaneously. And once the resolution plans are supposed to put to vote, that means that the committee of creditors can even approve H1, can even approach H2 or H3 or H4. That is the commercial wisdom of the committee of creditors. However, when this evaluation matrix was originally uh, introduced, that was very, very important. So let us see that this amendment took place on 7th of August 2020. On 7th of August 2020, whatever I have read so far, that was applicable from this date, 7th of August 2020. Now let us see what was before this. Before this, the sub-regulation 3 was like this. The committee shall evaluate the resolution plans received under sub-regulation 1 strictly, the word is strictly as per the evaluation matrix to identify the best resolution plan. So one is the word strictly, which is not uh, in existence now. And the second is to identify the best resolution plan and may approve it. It means the best resolution plan with such modifications as it deem fit. That means the best resolution plan will be selected out of the bid evaluation matrix out of the mat, uh, out of the parameters uh, selected parameters given to the resolution applicants in the evaluation matrix and it has to be strictly as per the evaluation matrix and then the only best resolution plan only h1 would be put to vote only h1 would be put to vote that is something which was up to 27th of august 2020 so therefore up to 7th of august 2020 evaluation matrix had a very, very large role and it used to be a very, very important part of the insolvency process. However, after 7th of August 2020, although the provision stays, although the evaluation matrix is very important, although the evaluation of resolution plans would be based on the evaluation matrix and therefore the structure of the evaluation matrix the parameters, the qualitative parameters, the quantitative parameters has to be selected and curated very, very carefully in consultation with the committee of creditors, because this will also communicate the preferences of the committee of creditor and the considerations of the committee of creditor for the purpose of accepting or rejecting the resolution plan as submitted by the prospective resolution applicants. So for prospective resolution applicants, this is very important for very important to see what are the preferred considerations of committee of creditors, what are the preferred parameters of the committee of creditors. And in case they fit into those parameters, they have more chances of winning the vote of the committee of creditors. Although Although there is no H1, H2, so all the resolution plans can, can be put to vote. There is no concept of the best resolution plan. There is no strictly evaluation as per the matrix. Now, like when I'm saying this, I will come to some judicial uh, pronouncements also, where in the judicial pronouncements, uh, we actually can see uh, the judicial pronouncements, like why I am taking up the judicial pronouncement at this uh, level of the uh, webinar, because first of all, we must understand what are the present uh, uh, value of an, a bid valuation matrix, how the bid valuation matrix is presently considered and how it is presently important. 
So the first judgment, which is as old as 8th of June 2020 from NCLAT, that is in the case of IMR Metallurgical Resources AG versus Ferro Alloy Corporation Limited. And in this particular judgment, the IMR Metallurgical Resources filed an appeal against the approval of the resolution plan by Katak Bench. And it was uh, the it was the appeal basically uh, that the IMR's resolution plan was rejected and Sterlite Power Transmission Limited resolution plan was accepted and it was uh, it was kind of uh, argued by IMR Metallurgical that failed uh, resolution applicant that the bid evaluation was not correctly used it was unfair and it was tilted towards sterlite power transmission. So their resolution plan, the IMR's resolution plan was offering higher amount as upfront cash. Therefore, the resolution plan should be rejected. The resolution plan of sterlite should be rejected. So the issue in this case was, what the NCLT, the issue was whether the NCLT has correctly evaluated the resolution plan, whether the evaluation matrix has correctly been uh, considered by the committee of creditors and finally the NCLAT said that the COC's commercial wisdom is paramount and that judicial view of COC's judicial decisions is limited. NCLAT further said that the evaluation matrix which was pre-disclosed was applied to both IMR and Sterlite. The COC ultimately approved Sterlite with 95% voting reflecting its decisions based on the financial and non-financial criteria. Non-financial and financial criteria, that means qualitative and quantitative parameters. So therefore, including equity, infusion, management of the corporate data, everything. Even IMR argued that the RP unfairly favored Sterlite by not considering certain amounts in the evaluation matrix. The IMR argued that there were some some amount there were some amounts offered by IMR in the resolution plan and that has not been considered in the evaluation matrix by the RP that was the allegation by IMR. However, the NCL80 reiterated that the COC's commercial decisions are non-justiciable and based on their assessment of feasibility and viability, qualitative parameters viability, feasibility, and uh, feasibility, and therefore the appeal was dismissed. Therefore, the objections based on evaluation metrics could not be sustained by NCLAD. Also, the importance of evaluation metrics was lowered by such kind of judgments. This was in 2020. It was actually much before the amendment, but yes, even in the very next month, even the amendment came that the the all the resolution plans will be put to vote. It is not that the uh, the strictly strict strictly evaluation as per the resolution uh, evaluation matrix that was also removed, and the COC is empowered to vote even the last in the evaluation ranking. The COC has the power to even approve the last resolution plan in the evaluation uh, ranking. Now, the another judgment, which is from NCLAT, again, it is dated 22nd of August 2022. It is in the case of PNC Infratech versus Deepak Mani, the RP in that case. So, in this case, this is from NCLAT, Delhi. The uh, PNC Infratech is the basically applicant submitted a resolution plan in the case of ERA T and D Limited. ERA T and D Limited, which is the corporate debtor in this case, and the committee of creditors, which was the sole financial creditor. It was a COC of sole financial creditor. They evaluated multiple resolution plans, including those from PNC, Infratech Limited, Shiri Metals, um, Shiri Metals. So COC approved the resolution plan of Shiri Metals. And the it granted the highest score based on the evaluation matrix. Therefore, the issue which was before the NCLAT was the uh, scores granted, scores granted by the RP, scores granted by the RP was 
not correct it was uh, incorrectly uh, scoring was done so therefore the enclad observed again in this case that the commercial wisdom of the committee of creditor is paramount and cannot be substituted by the adjudicating authority or the appellate authority the coc's decision to approve or reject a resolution plan is based on the business decision involving evaluation of the plan's feasibility and viability. The tribunal noted that the COC meticulously evaluated the plans and provided scores based on the evaluation, which is approved evaluation matrix. It was also highlighted that there is no mechanism under the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code that allows an unsuccessful resolution applicant to challenge the scores granted by the COC. Now, in the evaluation matrix, the scores are granted by the RP and the COC. It is finally COC. And the in the IBC, there is no mechanism where the scores can be challenged by the unsuccessful resolution applicant. So when, once this kind of judgment comes, the importance of evaluation matrix also comes down. So therefore, the NPLAT in fact finally decided that there is no contravention in the uh, order passed by NCLT for approval of the resolution plan. So the appeal filed by PNC Infratech Limited was dismissed. Similarly, there are judgments from uh, NCLT Hyderabad uh, in the case of Catalyst Trusteeship Limited versus Manjira Retails Holding Private Limited where again it was held that the COC's power is paramount. Therefore, the based on uh, evaluation matrix, the objections are not sustainable. Similarly, there is another judgment in the case of Jindal Stainless Steel Limited versus Shalindra Ajmera. And that was again where the uh, Jindal was the applicant. And it was also again held that the COC was in the supreme power. This evaluation matrix is almost the feasibility and viability. It is the commercial wisdom to understand the qualitative parameters and the quantitative parameters. So the commercial wisdom cannot be uh, kind of challenged by the uh, anyone. So now what we have seen so far, what we have seen so far, that how this evaluation matrix came in the law and how it was important and finally, based on the amendment on 7th of August 2020 and based on the two judgments of NCLAT and few judgments from NCLT, the importance of evaluation matrix basically was not over and above the commercial wisdom of committee of creditors. So this is what as the law presently now we will go to the format because we have said that the format is not one fit for all. So therefore, uh, so Ankit, now when we see, when we are reaching out to the format, uh, I think we actually would like to uh, seek some questions if there are questions at this moment, because see, the coming part of the uh, webinar is going to be very, very important because we are going to discuss something which is not available on public domain. It is not available on the formats given in by IBBI. It is not available in those formats which is given by IPS. So that format part that we would be discussing now, before that, uh, should we discuss something or would you like to add something or should I go to the formats? So we have a few questions. I will just quickly take them up. So uh, one of the questions is, uh, is that in most of the evaluation matrices, the primary objective of COC is giving maximum weightage to recovery rather than resolving the CD. Where this RP can influence and educate COC in this aspect. Doubtful as lenders are not at all interested in reviewing a, reviving a CD and even in accepting a resolution plan, their primary objective is recovery and upfront payment. So uh, this is the feedback and I believe that with respect to recovery, with respect to getting or you know discharging the liabilities of the company at an earlier time and settling those liabilities at an earlier stage is we also see that that's a priority of the lenders wherever that is feasible. And we have also seen that where the lenders do not have an option, the companies are going concerned, does not have any tangible asset which is being taken away by the resolution applicant then the creditors are also willing to, to give longer time duration for the realization of the amount that is you know coming from the resolution applicant. 
So I think uh, what my answer to this is that the creditors simply weigh their options that if they go for liquidation, this is what they realize at zero point in time. If they go for recovery, then this is what is coming to them in a few years of time. And the decision is always between how much is coming when. And, you know, because uh, there's also a risk that you give these assets to somebody and that person is not able to perform and uh, two years, three years go down the drain. That is the risk on the creditor's mind. So, Akit, uh, I would, uh, what you said is absolutely fine. I would like to add, if any evaluation matrix is made in such a manner, which is not even compliant to the legal provisions of IBC, that would not sustain. If any evaluation matrix is prepared where these other stakeholders are not even uh, not even considered, maybe for 1%, that also may not be considered as appropriate. I'm not saying based on that the resolution plan would be rejected, but the evaluation matrix, which is not even compliant to Section 53, that, of course, would not be considered as acceptable. So the while we actually prepare a resolution uh, evaluation matrix, we present it before the Committee of Creditors and the Committee of Creditors. It, in fact, I have seen that it becomes the duty of the RP to prepare a evaluation matrix, which according to RP would be the preference of this kind of committee. So then when we uh, go to the formats, I will explain how different industry segment, different situations, different constitution of committee of creditors will impact the evaluation matrix. But then a recovery or no recovery, the choice is before the COC. The only hindrance is that it should not be non, it should not be violating any of the law uh, of the land. So then uh, we have a question that we are uh, the, the, this comes from Mr. Hari Prasad. Uh, we are issuing addenda addendum, addendum as and when we receive new information. Is there any restriction on number of modifications addendums? I don't see addendums to evaluation matrix. Maybe. This is uh, the I, RFRP I, and the evaluation matrix. These documents are governed by Regulation 36B. And in case we are issuing different different iterations of these two documents, that would be considered as different expression of interest, which, which are restricted to two. And any third, in case we want, we have to go to NCLT for seeking approval for the third expression of interest, third RFRP, third evaluation matrix. So the only the, document I believe random, that yeah, the only document I believe Mr. Hari Prasad is mentioning is the IM. The IM can be updated. IM, IM is a dynamic document and that can be managed with the addendums. That is possible. Uh, then uh, I think uh, then I'm coming to other questions. So I think we have also already have taken up many questions during the first part only. I'm just trying to, you know, not repeat those questions. Mm. So the date, the date, last date mentioned in the RFRP is being extended for more than two times with the approval of COC. We are not approaching the NCLT for any order. Is it correct? What is the correct position? That's again a question from Mr. Hari Prasad. So the uh, date for submission of resolution plan that can be modified with the approval of the uh, committee of creditors without any modification in the RFRP or in the evaluation matrix. So the date for submission of resolution plan can be modified with the approval of the committee of creditors. That can be done maybe two, three, four times also. There is no restriction on that. Of course, the overall timeline of the uh, CIRP has to be considered. Right. Um, all right. I think rest, I think your discussion that is going to happen on the practical part of how an EM uh, uh, can be made, that I think will throw more light to, to everyone. In case anyone has any question that you feel is still relevant, you can please repost the same. I've reviewed the questions. They seem to be taken care of already. So, uh, as per the tradition and as per the various formats, given by IBBI and IPAs, there are two parts of the evaluation matrix. One is the quantitative parameters and the other is qualitative parameters. When we say quantitative parameters, that is primarily dealing with the what exactly is being offered to various creditors of the uh, company, including the uh, 
uh, operational creditors and including even the uh, the statutory uh, authorities and also like what is the total duration of this repayment because that also kind of considered as a quantitative parameter and also in case there is any equity upside which is offered or if any further money which is being inducted or infused in the company for revival all these things are considered as uh, quantitative parameters now when we say the quantitative parameters so the options normally we have is the upfront payment so when we actually try to say upfront payment we also should define the definition of upfront payment it can be even 30 days 60 days 90 days or even one year from the approval of the resolution plan by nclt so it has to be very clearly defined and in case we don't define upfront payment then it will be a chaos it will be a lot of disputed uh, evaluation matrix now upfront payment and in many of the cases you would see the very very second row would have the uh, remaining uh, debt remaining part of the debt or deferred part of the debt so that is the uh, normally very second part second row of the uh, evaluation matrix and uh, that also normally are considered as net present value and whenever we say net present value it should also say the discount rate the discount rate also should must be approved by the committee of creditors normally what we do is that in case the creditors are interested that they need the resolution they need their recovery faster than delayed so they can actually offer uh, a lesser discounting for up to one year and then steep rise in the discount rate for the second third and fourth year that will be a deterrent for the resolution applicants to offer a resolution plan where the deferred debt would be paid in more number of years however in such cases uh, how do we compare how do we compare the uh, various offers given by various pras now one is the upfront and i have seen some of the models are saying that this should be compared to the total admitted claims now if the admitted claims are 1000 and if i say that anyone who is giving me more than 35 percent or less than 35 percent more than 25 percent or less than 25 percent that is something which is uh, not known so then in case we are trying to say that we don't want to have consider any resolution plan which is offering less than 35 percent of the uh, uh, admitted debt <clears throat> that is something that we can add to rfrp as mandatory conditions of the resolution plan but that cannot be that cannot be the evaluation matrix that cannot be the evaluation matrix of the resolution plans why because see what we are doing is we are comparing resolution plans in case some resolution plan is offering less than 35 percent and less than 10 percent so what is the best thing that we have experienced in all these years and we have seen that the uh, it is basically the highest highest marks uh, should be uh, given to the person who is offering highest under this row and then the all others should actually be evaluated based on the percentile method so in case somebody is offering uh, 50 and the 50 is the highest amount offered so we will actually say uh, highest 100 to 50 and then the next is offering 35 so if 100 is to 50 so what exactly would be offered to 35 based on the percentile method now if the this is this is the way we can actually al uh, allocate uh, scores uh, in comparison to other resolution applicants now in the case of uh, net present value of the uh, balance part of the debt then again the net present value discount rate has to be offered and also the comparison between the pras should be based on the percentile method it according to my understanding it should not be percentage of the admitted debt because it is totally uncertain how much percentage of the admitted debt would be uh, would be the appropriate in a particular uh, case in case the coc says that 10 percent 
that means the coc is also saying that their expectation their expectation is about 10% of the admitted debt so this should not be the indication the indication should be the highest amount offered highest amount of net present value would get 100 and all others will be based on the percentile method so the difficulty comes and <clears throat> the difficulty comes when a one person is offering entire amount as upfront and the others are offering some part as upfront and some part as defer or some other persons are offering uh, where the entire money is actually being considered as deferred because their upfront also is beyond their definition period. So therefore, in some cases, there may be uh, only first row. In some cases, there may be only second row. And in some cases, there may be even both. So therefore, the, the best comparison can only be possible in case the total of the first and two rows are uh, collectively compared. The total of the first and two rows are collectively compared for the purpose of allocating scores to the uh, for the purpose of allocating score, scores to the PRAs. So this is out of uh, uh, my, my experience because see otherwise in case of uh, uh, as I said the then the situation becomes very very difficult and it is difficult to thereafter change the uh, the devaluation matrix because if there is a person who is only offering in one row or the two row that will be very difficult to consider now in various models it is also mentioned that how much you are offering to operational creditors and how much you are offering to other than financial creditors that also can be but the uh, again uh, we have to see what is the weightage that we are giving most most of the creditors are saying that let us give more weightage weightage to upfront payment and let us give slightly less weightage to the balance debt and they are not even giving more than 5% weightage to the payment to operational creditors. Now, like what are the other other like, quantitative offers? What are the other quantitative offers? One quantitative offer can be that the equity upside. Equity upside means that some part of, some part of the debt would be converted into equity. So in this case also, there should be some kind of valuation based on the discounted cash flow methods, then only the calculation can be made. How much is being offered in conversion and how the uh, finally the value can be seen over a period of three to four years or five years. So that also has to be evaluated on the basis of discounted cash flows for making a correct comparison. Like then a, a very, very normal clause which we have seen in all the formats is the equity infusion or fresh fund inclusion and that may be in the shape of equity or that may be in the shape of some other way of uh, infusion maybe preference shares or maybe uh, unsecured loans so that amount which is offered as additional amount infusion that should be very very carefully accepted because see like once the resolution plan is accepted and the uh, it is it will be very difficult to, to monitor how much actual amount has been uh, invested in the company and especially in those cases where the upfront payment is made and also some amount is offered as equity infusion so then once the upfront payment is made once the uh, creditors are paid then even the uh, committee of you know even the monitoring committee would not uh, sustain and therefore the verification of the one verification of the sources of the fresh funds, fresh equity, that has to be seen very carefully. Because see, the PRAs may offer very, very high amounts here, because see, that is not something that they will have to introduce immediately. So they, for the purpose of getting some more scores, PRAs can add more amount in the equity infusion or fresh funds infusion. So therefore, this amount has to be accepted very, very carefully, and the weightage also should be very low because see, uh, once the upfront payments are made, once the balance debt of the creditors are uh, paid or uh, satisfactorily provided for, thereafter, the fresh infusion or equity infusion, that actually would be totally a prerogative of the successful resolution applicant and will not impact the committee of creditors. Therefore, the scoring, the weightage for the conversion of the equity means equity upside, and the weightage for the fresh funds should be very, very low and very, very carefully because this is something which is 
mostly used for manipulating the scoring. So these, these are the few parameters which are considered as the uh, quantitative parameters. Oh, one of the quantitative parameters that also has been suggested in many uh, kind of uh, uh, devaluation metrics is the total term of the resolution plan. So some say that the term of the resolution plan and that is also being controlled by way of net present value and the discount rate. If the discount rate is high after one year, two year, that means that we are also kind of controlling the term of the resolution plan. So this is kind of considered as a duplicate that the term of the resolution plan should not be a separate item. The net present value, while we are calculating the net present value, the discount factor itself will bring this particular parameter in the evaluation matrix. So therefore, uh, the term of the resolution plan may not be uh, coupled with the uh, NPV of the deferred debt. So both, in fact, in case we have both, then uh, early uh, payment can actually get two scores. Early payment as offered by any PRA can get two scores. So these are the qualitative uh, uh, parameters, but then I will actually come to some other segments. First of all, I'm just discussing a plain vanilla, uh, plain vanilla matrix. Then coming to the qualitative parameters. So when we say that the uh, quantitative parameters would have weight, so uh, like normally 100 weights would be, 100 is the normal weight, and then we can give say 50 to the upfront payment and then 40 to the uh, deferred payment and then five to amount payable to operational creditors or other than FC. And then we can say equity infusion and fresh funds. So this can be something like 100 and then uh, each weight finally would be uh, considered and uh, ultimately it will be neutralized to maybe 70% which actually will be overall 70 weight would be given to the uh, qualitative parameters and then 30 may be given to qualitative or even 82 quantitative and 22 qualitative that again depends upon the uh, uh, the committee of creditors decisions when we come to the qualitative almost uh, the collectively in case we see all the three formats given by ibbi and ipa in fact all the four parameter four four formats so qualitative parameters are various like there can be maybe 10 or 12 qualitative parameters and every committee of creditors has to select according to their own choices, according to their own preferences. Now, the first, which is very, very important is the uh, kind of uh, uh, the uh, feasibility and viability. So in the case of feasibility and viability, we can say the financial projections uh, and their capability to meet the commitments and whether the uh, projections are kind of considered reasonable. So this is in case this is applicable where some projections are made and the uh, the and the restructuring or the resolution plan is based on that projections. The resolution plan is based on that uh, a kind of uh, revenue from the revived company. Uh, the repayments are depending upon the revenues from the revived company. Then this is the most important qualitative parameter that we must understand the quality of the projections, their feasibility, their technical feasibility, and the kind of uh, uh, also uh, capability of the project uh, technically to achieve those projections. However, in case uh, the uh, repayment or the commitment in the resolution plan is not based on the actual revenue of the revived corporate debtor, then this qualitative parameter is not important. Then is the management competence and the technical capabilities is also very important. What are the managing management ability? How much experience they have in uh, revival of the companies in the past? What kind of documents they are demonstrating? They are demonstrating in the managerial or technical expertise. This also will be applied in some companies where the companies are continuing and the Creditors are also continuing along with the company for at least three or four years. And the success of the revival of the company would be important for the purpose of resolution plan. Because whatever is offered in the resolution plan is also to some extent depends upon the effective turnaround of the company 
so that is something also in those cases this particular qualitative parameter is important then track record and experience of the uh, resolution applicant uh, track record also can be like the external credit rating and overall business growth in the past and the credit discipline that can be verified from civil or other uh, uh, financial information companies or even for international uh, there are financial information companies financial stability historical business growth these are all and the financial indicators in the company so when we are actually uh, designing a matrix so we actually have to just go through each and every part of it the once we uh, we try to see uh, the various uh, other options as i said uh, as i said the standing of the resolution applicant we have already discussed uh, so the then uh, we also see some uh, various other kind of uh, uh, qualitative and quantitative uh, parameters like there is there is one parameter that i have seen using because there was a possibility of merger of the corporate debtor with the larger group so in that case the coc in fact said that yes if the merger uh, would be a kind of a part of the proposal of the re resolution plan then they would be more happy because the larger company in which this corporate debtor will be merged that will assure their repayment so then they have actually given some scoring to this merger if merger is also possible because then it was also considered that it is only applicable to one or two companies it may not be possible for others so the as i said that the percentage of that is not a correct method percentile method of what everyone is offering is is a good thing then uh, when we actually talk about the qualitative parameters then we also can see when we talk about the financial strength of the pra then we can talk about the uh, one that we should clarify whether the only the financial strength of the applicant company would be seen or the group largest company would be seen or overall total of the group companies would be seen in case we say that the total of the group companies would be seen then we should we must define what would be the definition of a group company so therefore in case we try to compare the turnover abida or the net worth and all these uh, we have to specifically say that it is only the uh, the uh, the applicant resolution applicant would be considered or their uh, flagship group company would be considered or a total of group uh, size would be considered that has to be defined very carefully because otherwise this will lead to uh, disputes so in case uh, this is for the uh, resolution applicant but in case a resolution applicant is a financial investor then we can also say that the fund size would be considered or the asset under management would be considered or in case it is nbfc so asset side the um, values value of the asset side also can be considered and for the uh, for the purpose of in case the pra is an spv special purpose vehicle then we can say that in case it is spv then the uh, uh, group financial parameters would be considered or the leading group company would be considered or the holding company would be considered so all this clarification are very very important in the bid valuation matrix so then we also can in fact have very very important uh, part of the qualitative parameters that if anyone would be offering a collateral security or a personal guarantee or a corporate guarantee whenever we say this kind of uh, qualitative parameter we must also indicate that what to what amount up to what amount normally we say that if there is a deferred debt of 100 crore so we should have at least some percentage of the deferred part of the debt uh, that, that should be the value of the uh, corporate guarantee that should be the value of the collateral security or that should be the value of the personal guarantee so in case 100 is the deferred amount of debt then we should say it should be 50% of the deferred debt or it should be 25% or as we decided by the committee of creditor that value must be said so that accordingly the scores are given to each resolution applicant so we have already discussed the uh, regulatory compliances in the uh, qualitative parameters we should we should also see whether the applicant 
is regulatory uh, is a compliant company or not whether there are some defaults in the group company or not then we also can see the track record of debt repayment for the international debt repayment we can see the transunion is the international uh, credit information company and in india there can be sibil or uh, trilic or there are two more companies then we can also see like depending upon the segment whether there is a uh, possibility of technological advancement with the kind of synergy the resolution applicant has with the corporate debtor whether there will be some increase in the market size with the kind of synergy that the resolution applicant has with the corporate debtor so these are uh, the various uh, uh, kind of qualitative parameters that i am discussing so these are only general these are only general so i am reach, i am yet to reach uh, the uh, kind of uh, specific to each industry so when i talk about specific to each industry then no i think i would start specific to each industry and you know let us talk about so this is these were these kind of standard evaluation matrices now first we will seek the uh, we will talk about the real estate companies where the committee is heavier towards home buyers committee is heavier towards home buyers now what can be their quantitative parameters because see the none of the parameter that we have discussed so far uh, they would not have any preference to those so they can have the preferences of what would be the project completion period offered by the pra what kind of investment he would be making before asking any payment from allottees what kind of investment he would be making before even the and approve that the resolution plan is approved by nclt by way of interim finance so that the construction can start immediately and we can save time uh, what kind of additional amenities or common facilities offered to allottees whether the payment of the interest would be given to the allottees or not so these are the various kind of wish list for a committee of creditors who are full of allottees then what kind of quality quantitative parameters that they would have in mind they would have a quantitative parameter that somebody should have experience in the real estate industries the number of completed projects the default in uh, the delivery period in their past projects of course their turnover net worth of bidda then the size of their construction team so like these are the like see when we see this real estate uh, the real estate industry evaluation matrix uh, there is nothing common in the formats which are available Uh, on the websites of ibbi and ipas because this has to be very carefully and separately crafted for the specific industry of the committee of creditors now for example the committee of creditors is only made of the operational creditors then the operational creditors will say that the amount of payment made um, amount offered to operational creditors so like coming to the another kind of sectors like see then we can actually say there are company which are very very low asset based company so if a company is a very very low asset based but that company is basically surviving because of their existing customers or because of their existing software which is popular or because of their existing very very high tech employees which is uh, which which is kind of uh, uh, very important for the corporate debtor so in these cases especially the low asset based companies where the Uh, companies highest valued assets are their existing customer or their existing employees or their existing uh, product like software so then uh, i think the uh, the most important quality that they would be looking forward is the uh, companies having experience in holding on to these customers companies having experience in holding on to these employees companies who actually will uh, have some kind of synergy into the sip software so these are the preferences of the committee of creditors for such companies so when then there are different kind of uh, committee of creditors preferences when the company is closed and when the company is operational so in some cases the companies are closed and there are no possibilities of revival because of the technological reasons or because of the other reasons in those cases the committee of creditors will say that we would like to compare it with the liquidation in case people are giving us upfront almost equivalent to the liquidation then we will prefer those parties so they will actually give more support to the upfront however where the companies are operational they will actually talk about more of the capability of the management the synergy with the pra 
the synergy with the uh, kind of technology, the capability of uh, upgrading the company or upgrading the technology, the synergy which actually will help the company in backward integration, the synergy which might even help for the forward integration. So the uh, see now the uh, even the operational companies and closed companies and the companies where the revival of the operations are not possible, the different different preferences would be there. Now, in some cases where there are huge amount of non-fund based outstanding are there, then in the in in the uh, in the in the quantitative parameters also uh, the some parameter would be uh, given by the committee of creditors that anyone who actually would be protecting our letter of credits or protecting our bank guarantees performance bank guarantees we would be preferring. So that can be structured as one uh, parameter in the qualitative or in the quantitative. So in the case of uh, uh, CPC companies, infrastructure companies, power companies, where the repayment is also coming out of the revival of the companies and the protection of the uh, performance bank guarantees is more important. The um, protection of the various arbitration cases are more important. Then the committee of creditors will consider different kind of uh, parameters for the purpose of evaluation of resolution plan. The committee of creditors will say that anyone uh, offering us highest amount out of the uh, litigation uh, debtors, anyone who actually will protect the highest amount of bank guarantees, there will be some score to them. So this is something which is uh, Ankit, very, very important that I'm trying to say. Uh, so like in our experience, the committee of creditors, their preferences, and most of the time we have to, we have to uh, appraise the committee of creditors that this is what right you have and for a company which is a, a CPC company where a lot of bank guarantees are performance bank guarantees are outstanding you should protect your bank guarantees you should protect your litigation debtor of the corporate debtor because in case there are companies where we have 2000 uh, uh, crores of uh, litigation debt which is pending in arbitration so we are actually making some kind of parameters where we are saying that in case anyone offering us the highest amount out of the litigation debtors and in the lowest time, they, we would prefer that. So this is all that Ankit, uh, we actually have in our mind out of the experience. So, uh, so like, let us try to understand uh, with this kind of uh, deliberations, know what the audience want to understand further. So basically one, mm -mm. So these most of the questions are like beyond the evaluation matrix. So like one of the questions is can the profits of the company be taken as a source of payment and weightage lotted for this in the EM? So I believe yes, if somebody says that I will restart operations and that is the money that I will use to uh, pay part of the whatever money that creditors are owed, that's something that can be part of the EM. Mm. Then, um, if an MSME promoter who has built the unit from scratch, 100% prior experience in running the unit, offers a slightly lower amount than the other PREs, and if such MSME promoter's plan is not accepted, can he challenge it before NCLT? I think we have discussed this. That discussed you know, this part of the NCLT area. is not accepting any challenge on the commercial yeah. wisdom of the committee of creditors. We have also discussed that the EM marks are no longer relevant. The COC can go ahead and approve a different plan where the EM marks are lesser. Yes. That's also something that's not a problem. That's uh, doable. I think that's about it. I don't have uh, uh, you know too many questions. If somebody has something to say, they can raise their hands. We can try and hear the query on the EM part from anyone who has any such query. Fair enough, Ankit. I think uh, I think we, we have one one question. I will just ask Mr. Manluk to maybe share his query. Yeah. Good morning, sir. Morning. Yes. I'm Hanbanluk from Hyderabad Chartered Accountant. Yes, please. Sir, whether the committee of creditors really cooperate with the data to 
revive the unit. Generally, they will not uh, cooperate, even especially the bankers. They want to attach the properties and recover rather than allowing the uh, borrower to revive the unit. Is it happening or is it everywhere like that? Yes, I think the uh, it is only a matter of uh, options available. Uh, one option which is available with the uh, creditors is to recover as fast and then move to any other project. And the other option is uh, stuck up with this and with the same project and continue with the risk. Now the insolvency law has been made in such a manner that if a company is viable, if the company can be revived, there there will be people from the market. They will come and uh, pay as much as they can for taking over the company. So the revival actually can be left to the uh, entrepreneurs and not on the creditors. If the creditors want to exit, in most of the time, they would like to get their money and hand it over to another person who will revive the project company. Creditors are not saying that you don't revive the company. Creditors are saying that. Uh, you revive the company and you pay us the upfront in case you are confident, then you uh, the risk will be shifted to you. The banks have already suffered. They have taken risk about a project. They would normally, they would normally not like to uh, further extend their risk to a new uh, or to the same management. So what is happening is the, bank, the only creditor is the banker. They are not allowing the entrepreneur to continue because the loans are fully secured. Two times or three times of the loan, uh, loan outstanding. Even then, they want to uh, go for stringent recovery proceedings, for PCR or some other thing. That is the problem. Yes, uh, we understand that, and uh, that's what uh, the financing function works. Because, see, like uh, in case the money is stuck up in a project, the creditors would like to come out as fast as possible if they have an option. If they don't have an option, they would have to continue with the project. So they would look for the options in case they can exit a project which is not functioning or which is not operating well. It's functioning, sir. The units are functioning. The banks are, because the loan became an NPA, the is fully secured. The banks are going for stringent recovery of attaching the properties and attachment of personal properties, collateral securities. Is there any option available to the entrepreneur? I think, so I think we can that, discuss this. I think okay. we can discuss this offline. Anyways, okay, we are digressing from the topic. We can always discuss this offline. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much okay, for listening. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank it you. is our way of learning. Thank you.